Uh, hello and welcome everybody to the latest instalment of our research seminar series and today we're delighted to be joined by Dr Kerry Wong who I will introduce uh, properly in a few moments. Uh, just a date for your diaries before we get going our next uh, speaker is Dr Rebecca Gordon on Tuesday the 23rd of February at 5 p.m on mapping components of verbal and visuospatial working memory to mathematical topics in seven to 15 year olds. Mapping components of verbal and visuospatial working memory to mathematical topics in seven to 15 year olds with Dr. Rebecca Gordon on Tuesday, the 23rd of February at a later 5 p.m. UK time. Okay, um, so delighted as I've said to welcome our own uh, Dr. Kerry Wong today. Uh, you may know Kerry, of course, as a uh, lecturer in psychology in the Institute of Education in the Department of Psychology and Human Development. Uh, Kerry's a developmental psychologist and criminologist, apparently, Kerry, which is quite impressive. Um, and Kerry teaches across all levels of our undergraduate program and on our postgraduate program. And uh, Lots of expertise, of course, but seems to centralise mostly around mental health and well-being and cross-cultural research. And today um, we'll be giving a very, very timely presentation, I think, uh, titled Lockdown 3, Findings from the UCL Penn Global COVID Study of Mental Health. So very warm welcome to you, Kerry. I'll invite you to share your slides. Mm -hmm. And just while Kerry's doing that, if you do have questions today, um, you can put them in the chat box and I may respond to those, but I know Kerry's built in a lot of time for discussion Ooh. after Kerry's presentation. So uh, maybe reserve your questions until the end and, and we'll invite you to turn on your mics and we can have a, a nice discussion. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Kerry. Thanks for the introduction, Andy. Can everyone see uh, my slides? Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, so I'm going to leave the, you know, admissions of other people <laughs> to Andy and Matt at the moment, uh, whilst I do the presentation. But um, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see all of you. Um, and so many of uh, kind of names that I haven't seen before. So welcome to the presentation. Today, um, I wanted to start off by saying maybe a little bit about why I'm doing this, why I'm doing this project, what it means to me, and also how you can uh, get involved as well. So my uh, journey um, and the trigger point of really why I'm doing a global COVID study, apart from it being a very trendy thing to do these days for <laughs> researchers, um, is the fact that uh, kind of stems from my um, upbringing. So I uh, grew up in Hong Kong. Um, as you can see here, this is featuring one of the busiest roads, crossroads uh, in central Hong Kong. Uh, this is in Causeway Bay. Um, and this picture is actually um, from back in 2003 when the SARS epidemic hit Hong Kong. Um, so how does this all link back? So at the time, Ashley, uh, this is gonna show my age, but uh, in 2003, I was due to sit my GCSE exams. And I remember, you know, being nervous, uh, kind of probably like the students today, where they are thinking about missing exams and exams being canceled. Um, but back then, the SARS wasn't known to be uh, infectious in the way that it, uh, the coronavirus is. And I remember having to sit my mock exams wearing face masks, kind of like the students here um, in this picture. It was terribly uncomfortable, but uh, we managed. And I remember back then every day, uh, you know, if you turn on the TV, you would hear the news about SARS. Um, you will see medical footage of medical staff trying to control the situation. They're, you know, all dressed up um, and, you know, trying to really take care of the patients that are um, flooding into uh, ICU wards. Um, back then, and I remember it was literally, uh, you know, you turn on the news and you just see the count uh, and case numbers uh, on the screen every single day. 
Um, and still today, I still remember that experience and feeling, you know, nervous uh, pretty much uh, for a prolonged period of time. And then pretty much almost overnight, uh, these hand sanitizer machines and dispensers popped up all around the city. Um, and for those of you who uh, have been to Hong Kong since 2003, you will know that this is still the case. Um, we have hand sanitizers and dispensers at every corner, at every lift, um, at every escalator, uh, at every major mall that you can see, almost at every level and corner. So this became kind of an overnight thing, it, it felt like, and still today it remains uh, kind of, you know, 17, 18 years on. So we also, in that same year, 2003, made it to, to cover of Newsweek. Uh, I think this picture is a pretty, um, you know, uh, glaring one. And, you know, if we saw this picture now, it probably would remind you of coronavirus exactly to this day. And so since then, um, you know, Hong Kong has taken various measures in preventing, um, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, infection to, to that in that sense. And if you arrived at the Hong Kong airport today, you will be, it's mandatory for you to kind of take off your hats and any head covering to, for them to then uh, be able to test your temperature. And they kind of have uh, infrared screens that also um, screen everyone that go, that kind of uh, deboards the flight to see who may be feverish, et cetera, and measures are then taken uh, from that point. And recently, as I was doing the research kind of for this uh, talk, um, I also learned that we now have these smart robots that use UV light to, um, this, you know, sanitize everything and places like, you know, public bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. So really, uh, and this technology or robot rolling out, um, they primarily use it in hospitals now and across the airport, as well as uh, other public places, such as the subway or the equivalent, you know, of the tube uh, here. And that really um, is kind of how Hong Kong is reacted, I guess, at the time of SARS, but also what progress uh, it has made since then. And I'm hoping to kind of just have this set the stage for perhaps um, this is where we might be headed uh, towards as well um, for most of Europe and the Americas where SARS wasn't um, an experience that uh, was felt by many. And so, you know, I dug a little deeper into the stats and one of the key papers that presented on SARS back then um, in 2003, so this was published in May, I believe. Um, and so, oh no, no, so like a bit, you know, 2003, um, and it, this guy was basically the leading researcher at the time looking at SARS cases. Um, and you can see that the curve that you see here is not dissimilar to perhaps the first wave um, of the coronavirus curve that we see. And interestingly, it pretty much spans this, you know, similar months beginning from March till kind of mid-June, we see, uh, you know, an initial kind of curve. But luckily for SARS, that was pretty much uh, the end of it and things were in control. Um, although there were future kind of variants um, that uh, sprung up later uh, in Asia as well. So this uh, graph taken from BBC as of yesterday um, shows kind of currently where we are at. And I'm hoping then that for this talk, I'd like to share just a couple of our findings from the uh, global COVID study, um, given that we are currently sitting on a lot of data and I'd love for um, me, you know, through this presentation, I'm lo I'd love to share kind of what uh, sorts of study variables we have um, in order for other interested researchers on the call to um, get in touch and collaborate with us uh, in the future. Um, I'll also then be presenting a little bit on kind of ongoing work that I'm working on um, with others, uh, other researchers on the team and then open up the uh, presentation to a um, discussion. So, so just an overview, I'd like to draw your attention to the kind of top bar here. Uh, this is the kind of global COVID study website. So if you wanna know more, um, do uh, check that out. Uh, currently, 
Uh, we also have various social media channels, um, a Twitter, uh, an Instagram. But importantly, I think for people on this call, we have uh, uploaded pretty much most of our um, pre-registered um, study ideas and papers that we're working on, as well as study materials on our OSF page. So do check that out uh, if you are thinking about doing some analyses or wanting to work on the data. Um, a brief summary, um, we launched a 30 minute uh, online survey that was available in eight different languages uh, back in April um, 2020. Um, we started our first wave of data collection then and have since just closed our second wave of data collection. Some of the study variables uh, we uh, have collected include the following here, um, as you can see on the screen. Um, and we will also be preparing for a third wave of data collection um, in April. So not too long from now, it's, it seems like. Um, here's just a very brief overview of the study variables. As I said, these are also available on um, the OSF page. So do check that out in your own time. Um, but I really also wanted to flag or introduce a little bit the participants that we um, have currently who have responded to our study. So most of our participants, or in fact, all of our participants have to be uh, 18 years uh, old and above. And from wave one, we um, managed to have over 2000 respondents uh, to our survey. But really after when you've taken away kind of um, incomplete data or participants who completed only, uh, you know, less than 50% of the a questionnaire, um, we're at about 1,800 participants. Um, most of the participants are from the UK. So as you can see here, um, between the two waves, so the first uh, set of uh, figures you see here are kind of percentage represented by the various countries. Uh, we were also surprised uh, to receive quite a few um, uh, respondents from Italy, Greece, and also the US. Um, but also not so surprising because our collaborators are also based there. So we did, um, you know, through convenience sampling, try to recruit actively through those sites uh, as well. Um, and not to mention uh, a lot of the researchers in our department are from Greece. So I <laughs> just wanted to uh, flag that as well. And in wave two, we uh, managed to have 1,200 or so respondents, uh, about actually 82% given the ones who uh, opened our survey uh, through the follow-up email and actually responded uh, fully. Um, we also managed and decided to recruit new participants at wave two. Um, and so the resulting kind of numbers uh, pretty much are similar to the wave one, um, participants with a few, you know, with a few uh, fewer people from the uh, from Greece. And in terms of participant demographics, um, we have a pretty even, I would say, number of young people, young people in this case classified as under 34, and everyone um, above 35, uh, we um, are considering or classifying as older people. Um, the gender split, um, not different to other or many other online COVID studies, is heavily skewed to uh, female respondents. Um, and then in terms of ethnicity, we have uh, quite a substantial group uh, of um, white, Caucasian, um, other whites, as well as um, specifically Chinese participants, perhaps through the connections that we have um, in Asia as well. In terms of marital uh, status, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, over 40% are single, another large group who are married, um, and so forth. Um, highest education from reported by our participants, uh, most of them actually have a master's degree um, with, you know, 26% with a bachelor's and so forth. And then here in this, uh, in the next set of analyses, although I don't really present much on uh, income, but again, we have a kind of 50-50 split um, with those earning under 40K versus uh, 40K and above um, being the other, um, uh, the rest of the population. So um, at the get-go, I'd like to thank the rest of my team as well who uh, came on board. 
um, the idea for the study not just stemmed from my experience of living through SARS in 2003, um, but my, uh, you know, through conversations with my mentor uh, back at Penn. So he was pivotal in kind of um, pushing me to really, you know, get the study going and pretty much over a weekend um, collated all the materials and got through ethics and so forth. So um, with the rest of the team that are, we're all currently working on various different things. And I'd also like to give a shout out to my research assistants uh, here who have really uh, been pivotal in um, creating a lot of the uh, graphics as well as getting and disseminating some of the research findings um, in a timely manner. So, one of the first uh, things I'd like to uh, present to you now in terms of results is on age and mental health. And perhaps many of you on the call uh, who maybe are in touch with the uh, COVID um, findings will already know this, but I'm interested in firstly uh, launching two polls uh, to you to see, uh, you know, firstly, who's on the call, but also what your predictions are. And I'm gonna be doing that for a few of the results today. So first off, um, I hope this works. Um, you should see a poll right now, just simply asking you uh, what, which age group you belong to um, so that I get an idea or sense of who's on the call. Okay. So we have, um, you know, 62 people uh, on the call, and I can currently see, oh, and co-host, host count. Okay. Is there? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, great. So about over 50 people have responded. And I'm going to now end the poll. And you should be able to see in that a uh, majority or 32% of us uh, fall in the 25 and 34 bracket um, with another large group, 18 to 24, um, as well as 35 to 44 and above. Great. So, uh, so those are the results. Sorry about that. I should have shared that as I was talking. Um, okay, so then my next poll question to you is, in your opinion, which age group is most affected by the COVID pandemic? And I'm seeing a fluctuation in kind of responses at the moment, but hopefully I can share that in, in a second. Okay, so 50 or so people have voted. Uh, just two more seconds. Okay, so these are our results. Um, interestingly, most people suggested or just marginally suggested that over 55 are most affected by the pandemic, as well as a large uh, group suggesting that under 18s um, are most affected. So unfortunately, uh, I don't have data for under 18s in this study. So as much as, uh, you know, I might, you know, my hypothesis might be that under 18s are most affected, especially with school closures and, and so forth. Um, today in this talk, at least, and in this study, uh, we don't have data to um, investigate that. So the next kind of group, um, hopefully uh, we'll see what the results show. So, um, okay. Those are the polls, hope you enjoyed that, but we'll have more of that soon. Um, what we find in our study is just straight off the bat, uh, looking at um, age um, differences or across ages, how each of the psychological variables we've measured um, vary across ages. Um, here I'm presenting um, levels of anxiety by age group. And as you can see, uh, the younger age groups, uh, 18 to 24, generally reported at least higher mean levels of anxiety compared to the most other age groups. And I'd say because the error bars you know, do not overlap, at least with the 45 and above, that this is a significant difference only with those uh, groups, like with the older uh, groups here. 
And we find um, pretty much the same pattern for uh, depression as well. Um, and I'd like to also highlight that the, on the next slide, it may look a bit crowded, but generally we find pretty much the same um, for levels of loneliness, um, stress, sleep um, as well. And here a higher score is better sleep. So actually the uh, 55 year olds in our sample are actually having relatively better sleep compared to the other groups. Um, finally, uh, in terms of, we also measured physical activity and exercise, and we find that this graph is a bit more complicated. Uh, the the x-axis is still age, right? But what we looked at was people's levels of exercises before the pandemic and also during the lockdown. And so um, you'll see, notice here on the y-axis, this is a scale of zero meaning that before and uh, during lockdown, uh, older people in our sample pretty much reported similar levels of um, mild exercising during their day. Um, versus for the younger group, there was a significant negative a difference in scores, meaning that the younger people in our group really uh, were more active before um, lockdown, um, and perhaps not surprisingly so given the lockdown restrictions were quite strict. And we don't find any gender, real gender differences here. Um, and so from that initial set of data, we decided, uh, some of my collaborators uh, and I decided to look at whether across the weeks of lockdown, whether there were changes or differences in psychological well being. And one of the key things that we found was that when we uh, assessed across psychological constructs such as uh, perceived levels of loneliness, depression, anxiety, sleep quality, et cetera, we find that actually most of the other uh, variables in our study do not vary. So participants who completed the survey in week one of the lockdown didn't really differ to those who completed the a survey at a later time in the lockdown um, period um, on other variables except for loneliness. What we find, uh, what we found was that levels of loneliness was um, at least mean levels were quite high at the in the first three weeks of lockdown, but that um, uh, during the middle period of lockdown, it kind of decreased. There was a lower level of um, levels of loneliness uh, during that lockdown period. And then just before uh, reopening and lockdown reopen, uh, you know, easing, levels of loneliness again increased. Um, but caution uh, in terms of the results, these were cross-sectional, they were different participants who were completing the survey, um, but perhaps uh, it led us to think that maybe there might be other um, differences during the lockdown period that might be uh, interesting to look at. And if so, this will help us inform other kind of lockdown periods now that we're in lockdown three to kind of at least set the expectation that people's levels of psychological well-being may differ across the lockdown period. Um, and therefore maybe there might be some things that we can do uh, in the short term, but also thinking more longer term at different lockdown periods. Maybe these are things that we should look out for or at least let people know that it's happening so it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, this paper is currently uh, under review, um, but a short presentation of that can be found on our website um, as well. Um, so my next question to you is what has caused you the most stress and how has this changed during um, lockdown? So here's my next uh, poll, really between lockdown one and three, um, has these same stressors worsened, stay the same, or improved? And obviously we all have different uh, stressors. And so this is just a general um, question to get at whether things have gone worse, do you think? And about 70, over 75% have uh, voted now, over 80. Okay. All right, just a couple more seconds. All righty. And 
we can see that perhaps, you know, 50% of you, at least on this call, said that it's uh, really worsened. Um, I'm glad to hear that for, uh, you know, a third of us, things have improved um, and so forth. So what were some of the things that our participants um, told us? So in, in the next few slides, I'm going to be presenting you the probable kind of stressors that people have identified during lockdown one and two slash three, because our data collection point kind of straddled two and three. Um, and then kind of to see or consider how has things changed. So uh, data from the first wave suggested to us that the top five stressors endorsed by our participants were that other people not so social distancing really caused them uh, high stress. I know I'm um, definitely guilty of that one as well. And uh, a lot of people said that the uncertainty surrounding COVID, when it will end at the time, how it was even transmitted, um, were key concerns, including future plans, mental health, boredom, and also loneliness. Um, the x axis being percentage endorsed. So how does this compare to lockdown two? Um, pretty much exactly the same. The top five, I would say top three uh, stressors were other people not social distancing, uncertainty surrounding COVID, as well as future plans. But the two other uh, things that um, came up were um, this item of um, government COVID guidelines being um, unclear. Um, and this was an item that we added in during the second period of time, because it seemed like there was a public consensus that uh, guidelines and policies were uh, all over the place and so forth. And so we wanted to see also how this caused, um, whether this was a key stressor for most of our participants. And then another key um, stressor identified is other people not wearing face masks um, and or gloves at that time. So interestingly, when we look at, you know, um, obviously those of you who, who uh, are participants who identify these stressors, we then added a follow-up question to say, well, okay, here are all the stressors you've identified. To what extent do they, do each of these stressors cause you um, stress? So they rated on a scale of, on a five point scale with five being, you know, this is a lot of, causes me a lot of stress. Um, and so when you sum up the levels of stress or the extent of stress across participants, you see this uh, kind of curve from both wave one and wave two. And interestingly, uh, the curves and also the you know, mean levels that were that was identified at both time points do not differ significantly. Um, and you know, when we look at the top, you know, people who are scoring two standard deviations and above, um, you know, rating something like 38, uh, you know, a score of 38 and above, um, those uh, uh, that group also does not differ. Um, this suggests that people who have, you know, identified stressors in lockdown one and two, um, the stressors really have been perhaps persistent over time. And some of the work that we're going to be doing next is to look at those who are the high stressors, right? So people who had persistently rated um, their, these stressors as being very stressful at both time points, whether they then fare are you know worse off in terms of psychological well-being, um, and then also whether or not they're kind of environmental predictors of this persistent stress um, that they've experienced. As we know, persistent stress is a, a not very good thing for both our physical and mental well-being. And interestingly, you know, there were also individuals who um, perhaps rated high levels of stress at time one, but also changed to, uh, you know, lower levels of stress by time two. So uh, that's also going to be something that we will be looking at as well in the future. And so one of the key questions I was then next drawn to, and one of the reasons why I also started this study was to investigate kind of whether levels of um, or people's whether people's perceptions of others um, is also influenced by the stressful event of the COVID pandemic, and my uh, interest research interest outside of this COVID study is looking at um, 
levels of paranoia in the population, especially in young children. But for this study, I decided to focus um, and look to see whether or not um, when people are paranoid um, about others around them, perhaps exacerbated by a pandemic, whether this we will see differences across the lockdown period. Um, and so in this paper, uh, what I wanted to try and look at is uh, which of the variables are most influential when we um, consider all of the psychological variables together in what we call a network. Um, and network analysis uh, is something that is trending at the moment, but also it's, very, it's a very helpful way for us to understand how all of the variables in a model uh, relate to one another. And so my question, uh, next polling question to you is, which of these factors listed here do you think is the most influential during um, a pandemic? So I'll give you a couple uh, minutes to cast your votes. Okay. So 80% of you have voted now. Just wait five more seconds. Okay. So let's see what you guys said. So majority of you on the call said home living environment, whether or not it's chaotic, um, is the most influential uh, variable in this uh, supposed uh, situation. Um, so let's have a look at our results or at least initial findings that I'm still working on, so I'll present. Um, so here, what you're seeing is uh, what we call a network uh, analysis of the key variables that are in our study. Um, I just realized that it's not exactly super helpful for me to not have labeled these in uh, more legible ways, but uh, bear with me while I explain it uh, through to you. So let's start from the bottom because this one is labeled as stress. So just in the earlier slides, we were looking at the various types of stressors. And this variable or node is the extent of stress that the stressors have caused individuals during uh, the pandemic. Um, and here we can see that what the network is showing us is that the connections between uh, high levels of stress and this is anxiety and depression is pretty strong. So the thicker the line or the, you know, the stronger the, or the higher the number you see here, you can think of these numbers as kind of partial correlations or relationships between these two variables after controlling for all the other relationships in this network. So we can see that high levels of stress uh, is related to high levels of anxiety, uh, high levels of depressive symptoms as well. And in turn, through uh, this relationship of anxiety and depression, um, sleep is also uh, being affected. In this case, higher, num higher uh, sleep scores or poor um, sleep levels. Um, and we can also, through a network analysis, uh, learn that um, it's really these uh, here, this is depressive symptoms that are most strongly related to people's feelings of loneliness in our earlier work where we find that loneliness varies across the lockdown period. Um, and so this is, you know, what I find most interesting about uh, the link actually is not with uh, environments, so to speak, as it wasn't even um, a significant node in our network. So this network only shows all the significant nodes. And we realize and find that um, SPQ22, which is, um, you can, which is the measure of um, schizal tipple traits and also paranoia here on SMS total. Um, there are also strong relationships uh, between these ideas or perceptions of others um, as being threatening. Um, with levels of loneliness as well as aggressive behaviors. So just simply, at least these are initial uh, uh, analyses, we find that there is an interesting kind of uh, relationship between people's levels of stress 
relating primarily to anxiety, depression, and their levels of sleep, um, rather than this kind of secondary uh, relationship with um, people's perceptions of others uh, as being threatening, almost uh, environment or the, you know, you can think of them as thinking about the environment and how that also is related to their well-being. These are important uh, variables, but um, you know we can really understand what the causes of these of people's levels of stresses are. And so one of the questions that, or some of the questions I'm interested in this paper is to see, well, these are the findings from lockdown one, whether these findings actually are similar or different across genders across ages and across the lockdown periods. And to me, you know, understanding how the network perhaps differs can help us understand how people's um, psychological well-being has changed across time. Um, and perhaps uh, in, help us understand which of the variables we may wish to target during these stressful periods um, and perhaps which age group or gender. So the next set of findings I'm going to show you is gender. Um, and again, you'll see that it's the same variables as the previous slide and the same uh, relationships just by gender. And in our group of males, which is quite small, um, we find that there are strong you know, relationships with uh, depression and anxiety and stress, just like uh, we found earlier. And this in turn is also related to um, poor sleep. Um, we also show that, uh, you know, perceptions of others as threatening is related to loneliness um, and also levels of aggression that people have self-reported. When we look at uh, females, these findings are pretty similar, um, if not identical, I would say. We have definitely a larger sample of females. So the fact that we find uh, pretty much the same um, relationships and structure is uh, quite interesting, suggesting that there are no gender differences in terms of how these variables are related. Um, the, then the next thing we looked at was by age. Again, we find no age difference between the younger participants in our group and the older participants in our group as well. So suggesting again, there's not really something that we can target for um, earlier you know, or younger age group versus older age groups. Um, in fact, the variables are uh, related in this pretty similar way across the board. And so, you know, kind of, just to summarize these slides, uh, one of the things then this data, these data suggests is that um, it really is quite difficult to find perhaps tailored intervention for specific groups. It seems that um, gen uh, generally across the board, COVID is affecting everyone, but in pretty similar ways. Um, at least uh, this is what uh, is showing uh, in our um, results. Um, a second kind of, or the third kind of set of data we have is on vaccine. So we asked our participants, you know, at the time um, in wave two of our data collection, should a vaccine be available to you in the next couple of months? How likely are you to take it? So I know some of you uh, probably, maybe even on the call, you have already received your uh, vaccine, but maybe some of you are also curious as to know why people do or do not um, adopt or take the vaccine. So I just want to get a sense um, of what everyone on this call thinks about um, taking the vaccine now that we actually have the vaccine program um, rolling out. Okay. So about over 70% have voted now, and I'm gonna close the votes in just a couple more seconds. Alrighty, so great. So most of you are very likely um, and pretty determined to take uh, the vaccine should it become available to you. Um, and so, this is kind of roughly uh, what our participants in the survey also said. Over 30% over said very likely or likely. So this um, together is like, you know, around over 60%. But a good proportion, I would say 20% are unsure with just under and around um, 10 or here would be 
50%, also saying unlikely and very unlikely. So why might people say this? Here are some um, qualitative responses that we gathered from these responses. Um, for the unsure, so I'll start off with uh, the participants say, you know, I'm unsure because I'm vegan and I know that the COVID vaccines are tested on animals as well as humans, but humans get the choice of consenting to these, this, animals do not. I'm unaware how many animals have been tested and what the consequences are, were, and this saddens me. Um, so that's one, someone who's uh, decided that they were unsure. Um, how about the unlikely and very unlikely? I'll give you guys a couple minutes to read this. Okay, so a lot of them seems, seem to talk about um, distrust in the government, um, <clears throat> that they're hesitant to put something in the body that hasn't had such short length of testing, um, and that the vaccine is relatively new, prefer not to take it until others um, have taken it. And how about in terms of likely and very likely, which is the majority of you on, on this call. Um, probably some of you feel the same too. It would guarantee the safety and safety of your loved ones when you travel freely, that you guys believe in the science perhaps of the vaccine development. And that really is the right thing to do um, if we're to get COVID under control um, and so forth. Um, so um, what's, so this, you know, all of this uh, finding, uh, all of these findings are actually presented <laughs> sorry, presented uh, in a blog uh, on the IOE blog where I consider all of the factors. But here, what I then argue is that given that there is such a high proportion of participants um, responding unsure and also very unlikely, that perhaps some of the suggestions we would have for uh, government policies is to really um, encourage and make the vaccine development process more transparent in that for those who are unsure and very unlikely, their, their concerns are not completely unsurprising. You know, they perhaps are just wanting to know more information about how or how a vaccine can come to be in such a short time period. And therefore clarifying that process and procedure um, given, you know, unprecedented um, amounts of funding that have been kind of poured in to uh, vaccine development and multiple, you know, science, science groups working worldwide on the same cause, et cetera, et cetera, will perhaps sway at least the unsure group into the um, likely and more likely group of taking and adopting the vaccine and therefore uh, ensuring that actually our population is uh, protected and that overall the vaccine rollout will be successful. So I guess, um, you know, from these results, just uh, watch this space, right? Because we, as the vaccine rollout is continuing, perhaps uh, later in the year, we will be needing to really address the issue of, of um, the concerns that many of the people have um, uh, surrounding um, vaccine uh, adoption. So, um, Finally, uh, final kind of set of results. Uh, what do we know about vaccine hesitancy and adherence to government guidelines? Um, let's see. From well, some of our questions from our study, <clears throat> we asked uh, whether or not people have been wearing face masks when they go out during lockdown one and lockdown two. And we also had a question about what proportion of people in the community actually wear face masks. Um, so kind of getting people's assessment of their community surroundings. And here uh, for the UK in lockdown one and two, you can see in lockdown one, only 16% of our participants uh, were saying that they, would, they were wearing face masks when they went out. So this is back in April and July. And that's around them, people around them were, who wore face masks were about 27%. And this number um, luckily increased um, from to 50% and 43%. But how does the UK compare to the other countries at the same time? So if you think about just looking down the list of countries, um, Hong Kong, obviously, we ha they had lower numbers. And at the same period of time when we conducted the lo uh, lockdown one survey, um, things, were look things were quite good in Hong Kong. Um, 
if anything, uh, we our UK situation was more similar to the US at the time. And uh, Italy and Greece, they were a little bit, uh, I think, two weeks ahead of us um, during the lockdown period as well. So let's look at the results for um, the US. Compared to the US, again, uh, the, in, during the first lockdown period, perhaps only 55% say that they would wear a face mask when they go out. Um, and that people around them, again, pretty similar to what uh, they had uh, reported, around 50% um, also uh, wore face masks in the community. This number increased to 66 to 70%. Uh, in, sorry, Greece and Italy, uh, again, in Greece, it was very low numbers during the lockdown one, but again, the numbers increased up to 70% uh, adherence to wearing face masks and also the more people in the community uh, wearing face masks as well. And then finally, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, these were, we are talking about 100% of the respondents even if the, the numbers were rather small, um, majority of pretty much everyone in Hong Kong was wearing a face mask when they went out and they still are wearing face masks to this day. Um, and 100% or so are also wearing um, face masks in the community. So what does this kind of stark contrast or what does, why is this interesting um, to me? I think uh, based just on the lockdown one and two data, I think, um, it's interesting to understand how and why people choose to wear a face mask or not, but also um, that a large part of it, I think, is also got to do with the community that they live in and, and whether or not other people are also wearing face masks. Um, and in perhaps situations like in Asia where adoption of wearing a face mask is community-wide, um, individuals perhaps are also feeling more likely to wear a face mask when they go out. Um, but when we dig deeper into kind of reasons why people wear a face mask or not, uh, there are still kind of high levels of doubt as to whether or not face masks work um, and whether, you know, whether people can bear wearing a face mask for a long, long time when they're out and so forth. So um, I think there really is very different cultural uh, interpretations on the effectiveness of face mask wearing, um, but perhaps something, you know, looking at the numbers of cases across countries that should perhaps be something we should focus on and um, encourage people to do more of, um, especially in the, in the UK, I would say the numbers are relatively low compared to most other countries um, with similar, uh, you know, with who are in a better situation now. Um, and so I wanted to end on a kind of a positive note uh, to my presentation, given all these other uh, things that are going on. Um, so I wanted to identify kind of also some of the good things that people uh, spoke about during the lockdown period. Um, many people sp said that actually uh, people are um, enforcing more hygienic behavior and that perhaps is something that uh, would last longer. Um, they witnessed a lot of people helping each other um, and uh, identifying that uh, people felt more cohesion um, with their neighbors and their communities. There's an increase in volunteering activity that seems to take place. And again, also more appreciation for the simple things such as their friends and family um, and uh, acts of kindness towards the NHS um, colleagues, although some uh, there might also be some differences across the time points as we see that uh, in lockdown two things may have um, dwindled a bit um, and we're going to be looking at that qualitative data as well. And so when I looked at this kind of um, you know, by lockdown periods one and two, we asked the question, same question, how has the pandemic changed your behavior? And really use from these word clouds, you can see that uh, across countries that are from left uh, and right, um, working from home is a prominent feature in, their, in people's responses. Um, and that, uh, you know, many people spoke about online learning, uh, washing face masks, more so perhaps in Asian, uh, countries than the than uh, other countries in the sample, um, but 
when we also asked about what were some pleasant and unpleasant things that you observed during the pandemic to see whether people identified more pleasant or more unpleasant things. We see again differences in the word, word cloud. Um, generally, you know, pleasant things include, uh, you know, acts of kindness um, and so forth, but also the unpleasant things, especially I think perhaps notably in the Asian countries, uh, were things like discrimination, um, what else we can see here? Um, so, social distancing being a, a key feature. Um, and still, you know, this is like mixed with uh, unpleasant uh, things as well. And for those of you who can read some of the Chinese here, there's, you know, things like blame, not even, you know, in Chinese as in English, but in Chinese as well, that uh, people are talking about blame, um, talking about panic a little bit, which I found quite interesting um, as well as interesting country differences. And so I'm going to end kind of the presentation here. I know I spoke a lot. I uh, hope uh, Andy's managing the, the questions. Um, but what now, right? Uh, so I kind of took a long time to think about what, what next and what now. Um, and I think from this data, at least, um, it is still an ongoing project. So there are plenty of other research papers that will be coming out as other researchers on the team are exploring those as well as we speak. Um, but generally, I think there are kind of three key things that I want to talk or want to summarize the, the data on. And the first is that um, it's clear that COVID affects all of us, right? And perhaps that the data suggests that there might be specific things we can focus during shorter periods of time, such as, you know, addressing issues of work from home, the stress related to that, child care, um, and also, you know, factors that might fluctuate during the lockdown period, as we demonstrated, that these are things that perhaps the public should know more about, and therefore it's something that can be addressed, um, you know, with shorter interventions. But across lockdown periods, and also thinking more into the future, post lockdown and post pandemic, I think there is also this shift in mindset for all of us in thinking, is there really a post pandemic that we should think about? Or is it we should be focusing about what are some of the things that we've learned during the pandemic that we can build on, right? Um, and, and shift the thinking to more about um, adapting different practices like working from home. How do we make that practice more effective um, and so forth? And I know just thinking about teaching and maybe many of you agree as well that online teaching also has its benefits and doesn't mean that our our lectures are any less of lower quality. And how can we actually embed that to the future changing and the thinking about future of learning uh, and the classroom, et cetera. Perhaps it means that we have more hybrid method of teaching if there are also things that online working, uh, sorry, online teaching and learning um, can benefit, uh, can add to the learning process of the students. Um, and I think the second point for me was kind of reflecting a little bit about on SARS in 2003. And what, were some, what was kind of intriguing for me was to look back at the data and the papers that were published during that period of time and realizing how also important this current study and also other current COVID studies are um, in actually not just highlighting the things that we need to work on in terms of mental health, but I think it also highlights the you know, inadequacies of our social structures, right? And how we can better prepare for future pandemics because 2003 wasn't all that long ago, right? And many of us on the call perhaps will touch wood not, but live through another pandemic or similar where we are placed in the same situation, um, but in that next stage or in that next pandemic that we're faced with, we want to be in a better uh, situation and have quicker responses. We want our you know, governments to be able to uh, work quickly and act quickly with the respective uh, organizations in our, in our society, right? Um, and I, th I think that's the kind of key difference between you know, many of you know, Hong Kong and China having experienced SARS that has kind of prepared them a little bit um, better 
for this uh, coronavirus pandemic as well. And then the final point, and I'd love to open this up to hearing suggestions as well. Um, but personally, for me, I, I think that this is, you know, I've never been in a position or situation as of now where mental health is so widely talked about, right? Um, and I think this is the time for those of us who are working in this area of research for us to really um, try and get our work out there because it seems like a turning point for, for the field um, where you know mental health is no longer perhaps as stigmatized as pre-COVID. And therefore, this really is an opportunity for us to think about, well, how do we embed this and improve uh, our education system or early uh, assessment and detection of mental health in children and so forth. So um, I do think that there are also uh, lessons learned and opportunities um, coming out of this pandemic. Um, and I'd love to open up the, the floor to discussion now. Um, and just before I do that, uh, just flagging some of the things uh, that this uh, data from this work has contributed to. Um, we've been featured in uh, across, we've written several blogs publish, uh, publishing our data. Um, we've contributed to various uh, webinars and conferences and keynotes. And there are also various podcasts, uh, recordings uh, featuring our data as well, where you can find on our website. Um, and here are some of the uh, outputs, so to speak, from the study thus far. Um, but watch this space, though we will be adding to it. Um, and so now I'll stop there and uh, take questions. Thanks, Thanks very much, Kerry. And we've got a little, um, you know, we're clapping because that was very interesting <laughs> and engaging. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, I do just wonder though, Kerry, because of time, if you wouldn't mind putting your email address in the comments box, just in case yeah. there are some that have to disappear at one o'clock. Sure. Um, and they might be able to contact you separately. So, okay, first of all, if we could come to Nicola Abbott has a question. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I, was, I was just wondering, your measure of um, schizotypical, or I never know how to say it, <laughs> and paranoia, um, does that measure capture conspiracy theories or belief in conspiracy theories at all? Because there's been some interesting papers come out quite recently. I just wondered if your data is able to speak to connections. Um, yes. So it does. Yeah. So conspiracy or paranoia is one feature or dimension on schizotypy. Um, so within the schizotypy measure, there are still three subscales we can split the data into. Um, and we are looking further into that. I just haven't presented that data. Thanks. OK, if we go to Roberto next, please. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, brilliant presentation. Well done. Um, in the first part of your presentation, you you show some you've shown some graphs uh, in, in which uh, it's clear that over 55 uh, are doing a bit better, are coping a bit better with uh, mm. with the, with COVID. I'm quite glad because I'm one of them, so <laughs> it's okay. So they sleep better, they sleep more, they do more physical exercise. They have generally less anxiety than other groups. Mm. Uh, I found this a bit counterintuitive because, you know, uh, the older you get, the more at risk you are with, you know, uh, uh, being affected by COVID and also, you know, you are closer to death in a way. <laughs> so uh, your level of anxiety should be higher, right? So what's your interpretation of this result? Very interesting. Yeah, um, I think from my data, and to, unless if I go into or collect more qualitative uh, interviews with the particular age uh, groups, I won't exactly be able to pinpoint what the reasons are. So that's definitely a limitation. Um, but my gut feeling is that the older participants, or one suggestion could be firstly, an age difference in awareness of also talking about mental health issues. Uh, we know that there are generational differences there where younger people are more likely to um, talk about mental health issues and therefore self-report perhaps higher level, higher mean levels um, of psychological you know, well-being or worse, you know, kind of worse psychological well-being than older participants. Um, so that could be a measurement um, issue there. 
Um, and I would say perhaps generally maybe because older people are shielding more as well um, compared to younger uh, participants. Many of the older participants in our sample are also perhaps retired as well um, in, in larger spaces and larger uh, maybe homes. Um, and therefore perhaps in that sense, they have less or fewer stressors in that way than younger uh, people in our sample do have. So yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, if we could go to Julia next, please. Lovely talk. Thank you very much, Kerry. I sort of have two questions, but they're kind of related in terms of other data you may have. Mm -hmm. So for the network analysis, the first thing that came to mind is if you split this into people who live alone versus people who don't. Yeah. But I'd imagine the pattern may be different. And similar for the vaccine and sort of, um, a sort of uh, face mask data, I was wondering whether you had any way of splitting that into vaccine eligibility, for example, mm. or uh, urban versus rural sort of um, comparison situations? Because I know that people, those of you who live in central London, are way more concerned with leaving the house than myself in Little Tolworth who needs one person on my evening walk. Yes. Yeah. I have not left the house for over, you know, I don't know how many, I go out the house once a week, <laughs> maybe for like 10 minutes. <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely there's, you know, there's an opportunity for you to split the data that way, Julia. So um, happy to talk more about it if you're interested. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, Kerry. Um, there are no more questions in the chat box, and I don't think anyone has their hand up. But does anybody have another question for Kerry? Can I ask a quick one? Yeah. Of course, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. So, first of all, a compliment to Kerry. I don't know where you find the time to do all these things, <laughs> but you've done amazing with data collection, and you're sitting yes. on a wealth of data. So I'm looking forward to reading all the publications and an excellent presentation as well. And uh, just a quick question, have you thought about perhaps, or any of the results that you presented, have you controlled for the strictness of the lockdown measures imposed in different countries? Because I think that some of the things that you showed might actually reflect the different laws across countries. And since, since this is a global study, this might be an interesting um, uh, confounder or important confounder to control for. Yeah, so with the first paper on loneliness levels across during the first lockdown period and the weeks and so forth, we initially wanted to integrate um, various lockdown restrictions and take that into account because across countries, as you say, they were different. Um, what uh, issue we ran across there was the numbers. Simply, uh, there weren't enough numbers during the, you know, before restriction versus stricter restrictions. Yeah. And also, especially if you think about the UK, the uh, lockdown restrictions really varied um, quite a bit. And sometimes it's doing this, sometimes it's doing others. So I have a, you know, even if it was just one clear lockdown rule, that was it. I think it would have made the uh, you know decision a lot easier and for us to look at the data in a more uh, distinct way, I guess. But because of the policies varying so differently and kind of randomly as well in some cases, um, that was hard to control for. Uh, I think it, it for us, we're looking at the data across the lockdown period. So it's important to think about initially what, whether there is variation across the lockdown period, across the various psychological variables. And then if there aren't, then perhaps we can look at, look at it as a group lockdown period one versus lockdown period two, I guess. Um, but maybe I can, yeah, if you have other ideas on maybe how we can do that with this data, I'd love to hear it. 
Yeah, no, I absolutely, I totally agree. Thank you very much. That's good. I was just a bit concerned about some of the interpretations. For example, when you said that in Greece now they're adhering to wearing a face mask during a face mask during the second lockdown, yeah. it's only because now there's a fine imposed, a 300 euro fine, that if you leave your house without a face mask, then you know you'll have to pay this fine. So I, I don't think that people are adhering more. Uh, I, that they're more considerate now to others, but rather they're adhering to the law. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, like uh, there might be ways to control for it, and uh, yeah, we could have. A time. Yeah, and I think with that, that then you're, I think with that you're then digging into like motivations behind wearing face masks, and you know, different measures yes, for different people as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But excellent talk and fantastic results so far. Great. Thanks. Any Thank you, guys. Questions? I've got one more, I think, uh, Kerry. Uh, Zoe, would you like to turn on your mic and ask a question, or would you like me to uh, read it on your behalf? Please do turn on your mic, Zoe, if you'd like to ask it directly. Okay, Kerry, I'm going to ask the question. So Zoe asks, was the data presented for a subgroup analysis of UK participants as the variable seemed UK-centric? There is a lot of variation between public health restrictions and what a lockdown is across different countries. How's or how can this be controlled for? Mm, I think that's a great question. I think it's similar or related to Stephen's question as well about how do we control for lockdown restrictions. Um, I know at least from our study, as I mentioned, there are limitations and it's hard because of the smaller numbers and groups, even across countries, uh, across country comparisons, we are only looking at data where we have over a hundred at least a hundred in each country um, before we're you know, running any sort of analyses. So um, I would say perhaps drawing on other COVID studies that are out there with larger samples and seeing whether they find, um, you know, whether they find uh, differences ac across countries by lockdown um, restrictions. But uh, the thing is with a lot of the other COVID studies out there, few of them are looking at different countries as well. So the ones with large samples, they're very UK centric, as, as Zoe mentioned. Um, and in the global or other uh, studies where they have different countries, the struggle really is to get the numbers uh, in each of the countries to be uh, available to be analyzed. So yeah. So hopefully we can look at all of the data and all of, across all of the studies, right? When we're looking at these uh, impact of COVID on, on uh, our mental health. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any questions in the chat and I don't think anyone has their hand up. So I'm wondering um, if we should close there. Does anyone have any a final question? Um, I've got a quick question. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, just now you at the start of the presentation, you were talking about the SARS in 2003. Mm -hmm. So um, would you would it be possible to maybe compare like um, in 2003 compared to now having gone through both? Um, whether it was less stressful now because you've gone through the 2003 SARS? Less stressful. Um, I think this is such a good question, Minyi. Min um, I, I mean, I'm, again, just giving you my personal experience of it. I would say because I was definitely younger then uh, in 2003, uh, the thing that I know, I, I was most stressed out about school, about having to take exams in an exam hall whilst wearing a, a mask. So it was more of the day-to-day -day living, being a student that stressed me out. Um, but I would say because of that experience, I am more stressed out now because of the coronavirus. Um, um, I was wondering like if the if the age group was more like maybe specified to like maybe someone around our parents age so like maybe yeah. somewhere between 40 to 50 plus 60 plus because they would have gone through both as working adults yeah, yeah. I think that I, I can definitely speak say at least for myself like my response to the coronavirus was like back in December 2019 when I first heard uh, and I was in Australia at the time and I was thinking oh no I hope I can make it back to the UK after Christmas um, because things are going to be different and um, if it was anything like SARS uh, at the time I remember really not uh, leaving the house all that much even though there was no official lockdown it was you know everyone needed to sanitize everything we needed to watch out for things and uh, uh, that was that was the immediate reaction I've had since December 2019 with the coronavirus. 
um, and kind of back in the UK thinking, what is everyone else doing? <laughs> My colleagues probably remember like me asking, why are the people not already wearing masks? Like, why isn't this happening? So I think it's just a difference in the, the experience definitely hyped up my anxiety for coronavirus as well. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and participating. And thanks again to you, Kerry, for a, a wonderful thanks and interactive presentation. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, everybody. If you wouldn't mind uh, stopping the recording when you can, Kerry, and uh, there may be the odd question